Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of the She's Making an Impact podcast. I'm your host, Rachel and Gome. Let's talk money and how you can multiply your money and use your business really as a fire starter to create uh, a lot of awesome wealth and generational wealth, okay? So we brought in Sarah Young. She's the host of the Profit and Prosper podcast and the founder of Young and Co, a virtual CFO agency that helps business owners find financial peace and generate freedom and wealth. Right now, before we dive in, share this with another business owner and let's help you save money, multiply your money and create an even bigger impact. All right, let's dive in. Hey, Sarah, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited to chat. Why don't we start off? Just tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Absolutely. I am Sarah Young. I am the founder of Young Co., which is a virtual CFO agency. And I'm also a mom and I have a a two-year-old son, obviously a husband too, two cats at home. Um, (laughs) That's about the most, you know, exciting part of my life sometimes is my two-year-old and my two cats. But I, you know, in my full-time job, I try to not try to listen to me. I help business owners make more money and build wealth from their businesses. Cool. How'd you get into that? Um, I have been, I was a CPA. I've been a CPA for a decade, which is sort of crazy to say. I've been in accounting for a decade and I started in public accounting. I worked at Deloitte for four years and then I went to a large corporation and was climbing the corporate ladder because, you know, that's what you do when you're in accounting. And I mostly got into it because, I mean, there's a couple, like I'll tell a couple of quick stories. We had a really bad experience the first year we, my husband and I were married because he wanted to use a tax accountant. And I was like, I can just do it. <laughs> it's fine. He said, no, no, we don't need to we'll just have my person do it. And it was just a horrible experience. And I was sort of planted the seed of, oh, I could do that better. And then about six months later, um, we have a family business or my husband has a family business and um, they needed help. They have a pretty established business and they were struggling on the finance side. And I said, you know what? I can help. This is what I do. And so I did. And I just sort of realized how hard it can be for business owners to get good finance support. And I started side hustling back in 2018. And here I am four years later, I've been full-time in my business for the last little over two years and I'm not looking back. I love it. Okay. So as we dive into talking money and numbers, what are financial metrics that we should be looking at that matter the most? Um. So I think that there's a handful that are always important. And so I'll start here. I think a lot of people I work with tend to not want to look into their numbers, right? They sort of avoid it. Either it's because it feels overwhelming. They don't understand what their financials are telling them, or they don't want to look under the hood because it's like skeletons in the closet and they're afraid of sort of (laughs) figuring out what's going on. The going to come and get them. (laughs) Yeah. It's just, I think people sometimes attach like so many emotions to money as I'm sure, you know, right. For sure. And then what I see happening, and this is, I don't know if this is more so with women. I work out with a lot of women because as a woman, you know, I think women just feel more comfortable coming to me. And a lot of them will just say like, I just don't understand this. This is not in my wheelhouse. And my feedback is always you know, we're going to get you comfortable with this, like not to the level that I am, right? I'm a CPA. I've been in accounting for 10 years. I do virtual CFO work. Like, obviously I'm good at this. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be me, but there are some things that you need to get comfortable with because I think that for you to be able to make CEO decisions about what to do with your business, for you to be able to make, you know, investing decisions, um, for people to answer the question of like, you know, I have all this money coming in. My revenue has grown this year, but I'm still not paying myself. Right. Mm. I still don't, I still feel burned out all the time in my business. It comes back to looking at your numbers. And so I think there's a handful, I would say, I always like for people to know, um, I don't necessarily want you to look at this giant spreadsheet that QuickBooks spits out or that your bookkeeper hands over to you. I mean, you can, if you want to, obviously some people like it, most people don't, but I always say, look at your sales, obviously, except 90%, this is like a made up number, but like probably at least 90% of financial statements I see, and I have at this point seen hundreds, um, 
90% of them, when I look at their PL, like they have 20, 30 expense accounts to break down what they're spending, but how many sales accounts? One. Mm -hmm. There's like one line for sales. And that is always like one of the first things that we change is sitting down and saying, well, how do you make money? Tell me about your income streams. Tell me about the different offers you have, you know, so we can start breaking it down and you can very clearly see, oh, I had a client a few months ago, she had one-on-one coaching and then she had a membership and she was like, I'm putting so much effort into this membership, but I'm not making any money. Why? And I said, okay, so let's look at your revenue and her membership because she was charging like $20 a month for it or something crazy low. And she had all this turnover, right? She wasn't making any money. And I said, okay, we need to switch the focus a little bit and say like, as a baseline number, like you need to have a handful of one-on-one clients at any given time, just to bring the money in, just to keep the lights on so that Mm -hmm. you're not stressing about your bills. And then number two, then that will enable you to go build up your membership. Like I understand the long-term strategy. I get it, but like you have to keep, you have to pay the bills for sales, but like not just one sales line, like, please (laughs) Give me multiple income income streams. I love it. Yes. And then just like, I would say too, make sure, you know, like high level, where are your expenses going? Like, what are you spending on? I like to know, like at a high level, what are you spending just in a given month on recurring overhead versus one-time projects? Because we want to be as efficient as we can with the recurring monthly stuff and then be really smart with the one-time stuff. Okay. I'll say knowing the difference between those two as well. Okay. I'm actually like, as we were talking, I wanted to pull up my P and L just so I could look and be like, okay, how many income streams do we have coming in? And our, hold on our income stream lines. I think we have more than our expense lines, which <laughs> I think we have like double. So that's, that's awesome. Um, okay. When we look at the expenses and like recurring expenses, what are some things that you think are worth it when you have an online business versus like things that are a waste of our time and energy. Oh, okay. This is a good one. So, you know, people say like, what should I spend my money on? Mm -hmm. And I sort of picture your money as like, it's flowing through like a stream. And sometimes I use this analogy. When I was in college, there was this one like operations class that was horrible. Like you have those professors that were just terrible. And I don't know why, but there's one story he told in this class that I remember that stands out despite the fact the rest of it was horrible. But it was this story of like this manufacturing facility where they were trying to figure out how do we increase the output and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And they finally figured out there's one bottleneck in the facility, right? There's one machine or one area that things get stuck in and you can put all of the time and energy you want into like the stuff that comes before the bottleneck, the stuff that happens after the bottleneck, but you're never going to get more output if you don't fix the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing in your business. So a lot of people, like if I imagine like the flow of money from like the very top of your funnel, like how many leads are get, how many leads are you getting? How many eyeballs are seeing your stuff through to how are you converting them into your offers? What offers do you have? How do you deliver on those offers? And then how do you ultimately put money in your pocket? We have to step back and figure out like along there, like where are you getting bottlenecked, right? Mm-hmm. And there's usually one spot I think it can change. Like you're going to free up one area and there's going to be another area (laughs) that gets stuck. And I think a lot of times people tend to focus and tell me if you see this too, like doing what you do. I think people tend to think I need to grow my audience always, and I need to sell more clients. I need to get more customers Mm -hmm. and that's going to solve all my problems. And like, sometimes that's a problem, but then sometimes it's not. And so I guess the long, the short version is it always depends, right? But, you know, it depends on the stage of business you're at and like, where is it you're getting stuck? And sometimes the things that you need to do to like the things you need to invest in are not the things that are easy or fun for you. Mm -hmm. And so you procrastinate doing it and end up, you know, not making more money. Yeah. Yeah. I think the selling to more people 
Like, it seems like that's the logical thing of what you should do. But what I find is if you can have the same people, but maybe create a higher ticket offer that's on the back end, and it's kind of like the, the client, the customer journey, right. Of like, they come in at this price point, but then you have another offer and then another offer. What I find is that the higher ticket clients end up actually being a lot more fun to work with than the lower ticket client. I'll give, like, I, I'll give you an example. I have, um, uh, basically a $30,000 offer of like, if you want to work with me privately, that's what it costs. And one of, um, my clients, she goes, my credit card just tried to charge for the, it was like a three payment, 9,500, whatever. And she goes, it didn't go through, try to run it again, please. Cause whatever it was like marked as fraud compared to like a 197 payment times three of like, you have to like hunt people down if the credit card charges and then they ghost you. And it's just like a hot, hot mess. So it's like, think about how you could have a higher ticket offer. That's going to attract a better quality client. That is ultimately so much more fun to work with and a lot less headache and hassle. Yes. Yeah. I know the answer is definitely not always sell more, 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 especially no. like if your, if your offer is not profitable, like if it takes you too long to deliver, if it takes forever and you're not charging enough, then if you sell more, you're just going to make less money, right? You're right. going to lose more money. And I think that like, it's either, sometimes we have to focus on like, how can we get repeat clients? Because to your point, yes, like they are people who come back, they're more fun. They like you. We know they right. like you because they're coming back. And so right. how can you sort of serve them along that journey? The other thing too, that I always remind people of is let's also look at conversions. Mm -hmm. So I had one client who she got a lot of business off Google and was like, can I afford to spend however much money on ads? I want to turn on ads, turn up the Google traffic. And I said, okay, before we do that, make sure we're not going to waste it. Mm -hmm. Go back and pull, like she did sales calls. She had a high ticket offer. This was actually a wedding planner. So she had like super high ticket wedding plans mm -hmm. offers, whatever you want to call them. I said, go back and look at your sales calls and tell me how many you've converted. And it was like 20% or something. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, mm, that tells me either you need to work on the sales, the closing process. That would be worth worthwhile an investment to go from 20% to even 40%, convert double the people. Or the people that you are getting from Google, they're not qualified leads. And so getting more of those unqualified leads is not going to make you more money. It's going to be a waste of money. And so we look back at that too. I think sometimes people forget, like, let's, let's look at how many, like, not just the leads coming in, but like, are you converting them? And then when you know, if I do, like, this is my process, like I do X, then I get Y then you can turn it up and put some money in the front end and you will make more on the back end. Yep. Yeah. A lead, a lead is not a lead is not a lead depending on where they come from <laughs> and the quality of the lead. Uh, okay. So when we look at our PL statement, most important thing, income streams that are coming in. And then what would you say, like when we're around maybe a hundred thousand to 500,000, even like beyond that, what are some of the most important things we should look at investing in? Mm -hmm. So I think that, I think people need to work on, I think leverage is mm -hmm. what comes to mind. So what I mean by leverage is I see people get stuck at this like 10 K mark, right? 10 mm -hmm. K monthly revenue a lot of times. And I had a client say this a couple of months ago to me, and I did a whole podcast episode on it. Cause I was like, stop doing this. She said, you know, I feel like I've bootstrapped my business all this way. I've done all this and I'm getting stuck. Like what's the best thing I can do to get them to the next level. I said, you have to stop having that mentality. I think of bootstrapping, right? Mm. Like, I think we, we oftentimes say like, oh, I bootstrapped my business, right? I did it all myself. And what I find, so I am mid six figures, like working on getting to seven. Mm -hmm. What I find is like, what got me to 100 and 250 is not what is getting me to 500. It's definitely not what's going to get me to seven Absolutely. and understanding like, how do I detach my time and my energy and efforts from the ability of my business to run? And so I think what that can look like is how do you build out your processes and systems so that things are 
you know, scalable, or at least if not scalable, you can at least grow it. You can put team members in place and they know what the heck they're doing and what the, what the result should be. They're clear on what they need to do every day and produce. And you're able to, you know, make happy customers because your team knows how to deliver what you want. I think even like systems and processes, right? So a lot of the business owners I work with want to eventually either sell their business or be able to step back from the day-to-day and have somebody running the day-to-day. And I say, in either case, for somebody else to step into your shoes, they have to be able to pick up the processes, right? They have to know this is the system. I mean, that is what a business is, right? The business is you have inputs of time or money and you have outputs of hopefully money. And so figuring out what that is, I think, um, you know, I have, I have a coaching program where people are at like one to 200 in revenue. And then my CFO clients are anywhere from like high six figures up until low eights. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the differentiator is like learning that your time does not equal your money. And so Mm -hmm. making those investments to me is what I see needing to happen most often. How do you know when you're ready for someone like you to bring in a CFO? So I think that, I mean, that's a good question. So here's what I'll say. I think that most people, most business owners, they start with a tax accountant, right? Like I need to have somebody doing my taxes. Totally agree. You probably, most of you out there, like you should not do your own tax return. (laughs) Um, Please don't. Um, (laughs) And then they hire a bookkeeper and that's great too. Like you don't need to be coding all your transactions. And they think like, that is what most people think about when you think about finance. And the tricky part, I think, is when people come to me and they say, I just, I'm still not understanding what's going on. Mm-hmm. Like, I still don't have a strategy. I still don't know how to make money. Like I said earlier, like I have sales coming in. I'm increasing my business year over year, but I'm not able to pay myself. Why? Like, mm-hmm. that's totally common. I think sometimes people assume that when you get to, you know, multiple six figures in revenue or seven, you're just suddenly going to like be wealthy, but unless you know how to manage your money, which as we know, like financial literacy is a problem. We were not taught these things. Most of us, unless your parents did a good job, like sitting you down and educating you, but mine didn't. Right. (laughs) No, I mean, mine taught me about a mortgage, right? (laughs) They taught me about a mortgage and then I had a checking account so that when I worked in high school, you know, I saved my money. That was great. Mm -hmm. But when it comes, especially to when people don't understand retirement, they don't understand investing, they don't understand taxes. And that's because it is like, it's, it's kind of complicated. Like there's ways to make it simple. It's probably not as complicated as people think it is, Mm -hmm. but I could understand as someone who's not you know, with a decade plus experience in finance, I could totally understand why you'd be overwhelmed. Um, But I think like, we're just not taught these things. And then we're, if we're not taught personal finance literacy, we're definitely not taught business financial literacy. So I think the time to get help is when you're saying like, okay, I've got, you know, these sort of foundational things in place. And I'm thinking like, I still don't understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because, you know, just to be fair, like a bookkeeper is there to code your transactions. They're not there necessarily to help you interpret why your business isn't making money. That's a strategic sort of skill. Certainly some bookkeepers can do it, but as a, you know, I wouldn't go in assuming that your bookkeeper is going to know that. And then, you know, your tax accountant, they're focused on prepping your tax return. Like they're not going to be there to say like, here's how you can make more money in your business. They might have the skills to do it, but they don't generally have the time. So I think whenever you get to that place where you're questioning those things, you're saying, how can I have a strategy in place to actually start building wealth for my business? What does that look like for me? And then how do I actually manage my money? So it like, doesn't fly back out the door again, as soon as you bring it in, then I would say that's when you start looking at a CFO. Got it. Let's talk tax saving strategies. So my bookkeeper just sent us our P&L for last month and told me to set aside X amount to pay in taxes for the month. And I'm just like, oh, it's so, it's so much money, which is like, it's a great problem, I guess, because it means we're doing really well, but I'm like, okay, how can we have like 
what strategies do we have so we don't have to pay this giant chunk in taxes? Yeah. So, okay. I have, I have some opinions about taxes. I think that, you know, to an extent, if you're making money, you will pay taxes. If you have, let me put it a different way. If you have taxable income on your tax return, you will pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And taxable income is, you know, salary. If you had a job when you're, when you had a W-2 salary that went on your tax return, that was taxable income. If you have business income, like if you show profit in your business, you are going to have taxable income. And I'm not one of those like tax accountants. It's like, oh, we can write off everything in your personal life to get your business income down to zero, because I think that's sketchy, (laughs) frankly. But I think, you know, there are definitely things that you can do to minimize your taxes. There's a handful of things that will save taxes without doing this. But in most cases, I would say, if you want to save on taxes, you have to spend money or invest money because you have to understand that the tax code is written the way it is to incentivize people to do certain things. Mm -hmm. So you get deductions when you have a business, you can write off the expenses because they want you to own a business because that stimulates the economy. You get, you know, some investments have lower tax rates, rental property, you get depreciation on the house. Like all of these things are here to incentivize you to invest, to grow a business, to do all these things. Right. And so when I say like, you have to spend money to save money, I think it's one of the things I work on with people is saying, okay, when you get your business to a place where you make enough money to pay yourself a regular salary, we got to keep the lights on in your house, right? Then we're going to start thinking about the extra cash flow you have and saying, you know, what are your long-term plans? Are you like most of my clients and me and you want to retire early? If so, what does that look like? Does that mean you want to have prop? You want to have real estate? Does that mean you want to start having, you know, you want to put money in the stock market? There's all kinds of different things you can do, but generally like when you put money into these investments, there are tax breaks. And so I think it's like starting to be strategic about like, okay, now my business is making enough money that the tax bill really hurts. Mm -hmm. That's when I would ask, like, are you in a place where you can start doing some of these things? And then let's layer in, you know, taxes as a piece of that, because if we structure things a certain way, there's tax advantages to that. Structure how? It just, so I think as an example, recently I had a client, they sold their business and then they took their money they got from their business, gave it to a financial advisor. They didn't talk to me about this, by the way, beforehand, they gave it to a financial advisor. And then I was doing their taxes for 2021 And I got their statement from the financial advisor. And I was like, he put all of your money in stuff that there's no, no tax advantage whatsoever, Mm -hmm. like none. And so their tax bill is painful again. And so instead it's like, okay, if you're going to have it, you know, they had money in um, mutual funds or something. And I was like, what if we take some of that, like buy a rental property? They already had one, so they were comfortable with it. Like, what if we buy another one? Like, what does that look like for your cash flow? Like, cash flow is good, tax advantages are good. Like, just thinking about, you know, not necessarily throwing all your money into one one bucket. I like to have diversification and then making sure you're layering in things that do have tax advantages in there too. Okay. So biggest thing, real estate. And then what would be an example of like investments, other investments outside of real estate? I think people, when people think about, you know, building wealth, like the first thing that probably comes to mind for most people is retirement accounts. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. Um, And we totally layer that in because you can either, you know, put money in this year and get a tax break this year or put it into a Roth account. You don't get a deduction now, but you don't pay any tax later on any of on the earnings or the principal when you take it out. And that's also amazing. But I think sometimes we forget that those assets you can only access when you're, you know, retirement age. Mm -hmm. And so I'm 35. I want to retire. I don't, I say retire, like I'll probably still work because I love what I do, (laughs) but I just want to have the options to retire within like five to 10 years. And so I can't pile all my money into retirement accounts because I can't access it. Right. And so we have to think about what are ways that you can start using your money now to start building up assets that you can access 
you know, both pre and post retirement. Mm -hmm. And so pre retirement accounts would be things like, I mean, your business could be one. If you kind of do what we talked about earlier and say, I'm building it up so that it can run without me. Mm -hmm. If you build it up to where it produces cash flow and you can go sit on the beach and have a margarita, like to me, that's great. <laughs> um, a lot of my clients too will buy, in addition to real estate, they'll do rental properties. People love Airbnbs now. I also have to say, I really love commercial properties. I've seen enough um, acquisition deals to see like somebody can sell their business. And the property, like they had their business and then they also owned the building that their business used. Mm -hmm. They sold the business to somebody. And so not only did they get the money from the sale, but then they continue to get paid rent nice. every single That's month. That's a nice from, deal. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then I've seen several times too, where the actual real estate, the building for the business is worth as much as the business is. If wow. you were to go sell it, if you buy it right. Mm -hmm. I think people don't think about commercial property. They feel like, mm, this is scary. I'm going to stick to residential real estate, which is totally fine. But in my opinion, like, I feel like there's a lot of people doing Airbnbs now and it's getting to be more and more competitive. There's all these big companies going in, in my area. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. There's like a ton of these companies buying up all of the, you know, sort of smaller homes mm -hmm. and turning them into rental properties, which really like throws off the market. That's like a yeah. whole different conversation, but like that, yeah. like looking at sort of the, you know, for example, I have an office. Mm -hmm. I'm like, if I could find, you know, an office condo or something that I could buy, and then my business rents from me, like then I've got both, you know, my business is not just supporting me, but it's also building up the equity in my Mm -hmm. you know, commercial space. So that's another one. And then several of my clients too buy franchises. I will say I'm not always a huge fan of a franchise because a lot of them, not all of them, but certainly some franchises, they'll promise the world. And then you get into the franchise and it's not as good as it sounds, you know, Probably. so, yeah. but I mean, that could all, that is also a good option too. And so it's really just, again, like being intentional. I think my last, my least favorite is a plain old brokerage account mm -hmm. because I mean, a brokerage account where you just put money into stocks and bonds and stuff, right. Versus a retirement account. There's no like tax advantage really to a brokerage account. Um, so in the U S you have capital gains tax. When you sell your stock, it's lower. The rate is lower than your income tax. But if you also have business income, then if your income is too high, then the tax rate on, you know, the selling stocks can also get really high. And so it's my, it's not my favorite. Um, it's better than nothing though. I would can say. you borrow against things that you have in the brokerage account to buy real estate? So people, this is like one of those things I see all the time on Instagram mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. So there's this, um, they'll always like phrase it as like, this is what the wealthy people do. And like, mm -hmm. this is true what they're saying. And so basically I'll sort of explain, like, let's say I have a million dollars in a brokerage account and it, it's an, that this is an asset is worth something. It has value. I can go to, you know, certain banks and say, Hey, I'm going to put my million dollars in my brokerage account up as collateral and I'm give me a loan. And so the loan, when you get the money is not taxable income because you don't get taxed on loans. But if you were to sell the assets in the brokerage account that is taxable. And so we avoid paying taxes by taking out the loan. And this is one of those things that I'm like, I feel like it's clickbait when people talk about it. One, I think that unless you have like a really great financial advisor or you yourself are like very savvy with investing, like, because when you take out the debt, you're going to have interest that you pay mm -hmm. on the debt. And the theory is the interest on the loan is going to be less than the earnings in the investments. And so as long as that is true, so as long as your investments are making like, let's say 7% and the interest is 4%, you're still coming out ahead. Right. But I guess what makes me nervous is like people doing this in reality and then you know, like what, what if, really happens, <laughs> right? Like what if it, like, what if it, like, what if you just don't know what you're doing? Um, you know, I say 
my husband is very into real estate. We've had rental properties in the past and the market now has been crazy where we live. And so we're like waiting. <laughs> we're like sharks. We're like waiting to buy something. Um, not in a mean way, not in a sharky way, but we're just waiting yep. anyways. So, you know, there is a thing where like, let's say you buy a house, you buy a rental property and the value of it goes up over this course of a few years, you can refinance the house. Let's say you bought it for 200 and it goes up to 300. You can go to the bank and say, I want to refinance this and get a loan out for, you know, whatever 80% of the 300 is, which would be you getting an extra, let's say 40, $50,000 out, right. That you can then turn around and go invest. But you do have to keep in mind when you take out the loan again, that has interest. Mm -hmm. If it's a rental property, the interest is a deductible generally speaking, but you know, these are like, these are like advanced, totally. advanced strategies. I love the advanced strategies though. Cause I feel like I've gotten a lot of the basics done. And so my husband and I are like, okay, how can we like go all in, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I love, you can, I, I feel like I'm excited over here. I love to talk about this stuff. Um, and just to sort of back up though, for people who are listening, who are like, I don't have the basics done. We have basics on the podcast because we've had a bunch of different like CPAs and different interviews that we've done. So I figured since we have the basics covered, I mean, you can go yes. deeper. <laughs> yes. Well, for you listening, do the basics first. Yep. And then when you feel good about the basics, then we can do some next level stuff. But I'm with you, like, you know, the multiple income streams thing to me is, is, you know, I want my business to be an income stream, but then I also want to have, you know, dividends from stocks. I want to have rental income coming in. I want to have more than just my business yeah. as a long-term strategy. So yeah, my, my husband and I, we own land in Senegal um, where he's from. So we lived there last year and we set up car rentals. So now we have, I think eight cars that we're renting. Um, and then we're building a chicken coop and their bank in Senegal, they give us 4% interest on our money. And then if we want a loan to do other stuff, it's 6%. So it's typically like actually 2% when you count in like 4% we're getting. So we're like, okay, we could get a loan, finish this, buy more land. Cause the land appreciates like crazy. Um, and then my husband found a hay property here in Florida and he was like, Ooh, we could do this too. I'm like, okay, we have, we have a lot of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my, we, for a while, I think the timing, we we're trying to figure out the best timing for it, but we're like, we want to get like a laundromat or like vending machines or those ice vending machines, like something you just like put there and then just go by and collect your money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, okay. My, my son plays baseball and as we're going to all the batting cages and stuff, a lot of them, is just like a coin operated thing. And there's one person kind of overseeing the entire thing. So we bought land here in equestrian property in Orlando. But we're like, could we put a batting cage there? Cause it's cheaper to have the machine coin operated machine than like feed horses and do all this stuff. And like oh my all gosh. The, the expenses related with that. So we're like looking at batting cages and getting quotes and that kind of thing. And we're like, Oh, then we wouldn't have to pay. It's like $30 for a half an hour and driving 45 minutes. We could have it here. And then there's such a demand here. So we're like, uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> we did that a few months ago at a putt putt place because we walked into this like big putt putt place and there's one person handing out the balls, right? Yep. You pay and hand out the balls and then the rest of it, you just go through. I mean, surely there's more maintenance with the putt putt place than with a batting cage, but right. same thing, right? So I think, you know, like the, what, what is coming to mind for me though, is just like stepping back and saying, not the investing basics, but like, this is enabled by your business, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that is really the whole point. And that's why I do, you know, virtual CFO work, meaning I help people step back and say like, how can your business be the fire starter? Like Mm -hmm. not just pay you a salary, which a lot of people don't pay themselves regularly. And so, yes, we want to get you there, but then when you're, you know, as when you get to where you're paying yourself a salary, then like, how can we take it to the next level? Mm -hmm. Especially with women. I find that when I say like, what are you here for? They'll say things like, oh, I want to help people, et cetera, et cetera. And like, so do I, but like, also I want to make money. And like, what is the purpose of this money? And a lot of them will say, well, I'm putting the extra in my kids, 529s, da, da, da. I'm like, mm. okay, no, like we have to step back and like, say, well, what, what do you really want to do? And you don't have to, you know, do like us and go buy 
like vending machines and batting cages and land, <laughs> like totally not. <laughs> but if the point of your business is to, you know, I had a client who was like, I want to buy, a, she's a chef. I want to buy a property out. I want to have a farm. I want to have, you know, this is my dream life. I'm like, well, how is your business going to fund you? Not just having the money to buy the farmhouse, but also the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we have to like, you know, start there, but like have the end goal in mind to get you excited about doing the stuff in your business. Yeah. The fire starter. I like that. What does it mean to you to make an impact? Mm. My whole thing is exactly what we're talking about. I think that I work mostly with women, um, a couple of cool dudes, <laughs> but a lot of women. And what I really want is for more women business owners to make more money. Because to me, I think more money is freedom, it's choice, it's power, it's options. And I just feel like, like for me, ultimately, like I just want more money in the hands of people who don't look like the traditional people who have all the money. Right. Mm -hmm. So in my, I have a group coaching program that is where, you know, we get, you get access to me as a CFO, but in a group format and we work through these types of things when you're doing like a hundred to, you know, 300, 400 K in your business. And one of the things I've kind of recently started saying, and this was like kind of scary for me to say out loud because I'm like, what if I fail? But anyways, my whole thing is I want over the span of however many years, like if I can help a thousand business owners get to a hundred thousand dollars, just the the first 100 K out of your business, I think is a huge milestone. And then once you get there, like, you know what to do a thousand times a hundred K each is a hundred million dollars. And I looked at that and I was like, holy crap, can you imagine like a hundred million dollars in the hands of like business owners? I think that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. What's um, one of the best books you've read? My, I think the best book that I have read for business, I always say Atomic Habits, which is not really a business book, but I personally love it. And what I, what I appreciated about it was this idea of like 1% better. Mm -hmm. because I am a perfectionist at heart, like raging perfectionist. And I have to fight against these tendencies all the time. And so getting past this idea of like, if I can't do it all immediately, it's not good enough. And just saying like, if I could get 1% better a little bit every day, then after a year, you look back and you say like, wow, I did so good. As opposed to saying like, let me do this one big, huge effort up front. And then you fail because it's not sustainable because you're trying to be perfect right out the bat. I think that that whole concept was very enlightening for me. (laughs) It's true though. Like when I look back over the past 12 years, I've been doing this. I'm like, holy crap. (laughs) But like, it's small things over time. You know, it's not like one big thing that you do. Yeah. 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 It's the daily stuff. It's like, you know, breaking it all down. It's not like doing the huge things, right? I mean, they certainly help like, you know, I know you just did um, the marketing, I forget the conference, like the big marketing marketing impact academy. Yeah. Yeah. Like certainly like that is huge, but like you got there by doing like all of the little day-to-day things over the course of 12 years, right? Yep. Listening to personal development CDs in the car on the way to grad school. <laughs> yep. Just like that consistency for sure. Uh, where can we connect with you? Um, I have a podcast it is the Profit and Prosper podcast. So I will tell you, I don't talk about super boring money stuff. I talk about, you know, big picture, like how can you increase your cash flow and make more money and build your wealth. Um, and then on Instagram too, I recently changed my handle. It's it's Sarah Young is my primary Instagram handle. And so you can find me there. And if you listen and you love this podcast, send me a DM. I love to talk to people. Cool. Sarah, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you. Thanks for having me.